This week on the How To Be 60 podcast, Susan Cookson, a.k.a. Wendy Posner from Emmerdale, joins us. It was her first big job after losing her beloved husband, Malk. And like so many people, she's still adjusting. I can't believe it's not here. How did we end up like this? You know, because I really thought we were going to grow old and grey together. And I'm wondering how to be 60. It's scary. The shit out of me. Hello, hello. Time for another blast of How to Be 60 with me and her, Adams and Mackenzie. <laughs> I've actually just beat the dentist, so I'm feeling a bit fragile. So you're in for an easy ride, yeah. What did you get done? Your wallies. Oh, God. What, my wallies. Your wallies. What did oh, you get God, done? Oh, God, I've forgotten that. That was false teeth. That you oh, no, that, wallies, wasn't are, it? You, are you sure you're on? Of course they might well. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> be fair. You know what it's like? I'm kind of propping them up. So there's one at the back that's crumbled. And so they have to put a crown on. I've got terrible teeth, actually. I mean, I have to say. Because, I mean, the sugar that I ate when I was a kid. Well, but mine are like a tarmac road. Well, oh, like what? A tarmac road. You know, with all the fillings inside. Oh, I know. I know. But I, um, I was actually lying near the dentist's chair. And, oh, you know, it's like, uh, uh, all the stuff. And I thought, God, remember the day when, like, you, like, you're, not my mum actually, she didn't have false teeth, but all my mum's friends just had false teeth. Oh, my mum and dad both had. They just false took teeth. them out, didn't they? they? Do you know my dad got false teeth when he was fourteen, and his teeth. Yeah, and do you know what? He was born and brought up on a farm, so you would think they'd be decent, sort of, you know, lots of milk and cream and and eggs and whatnot. And his claim to fame was that he could bite into an apple. Do you know I must have maybe twelve, with his bare gums. Into an apple, crunching into an apple. Well, just taking the teeth out? Yeah. Oh, my God. Jesus, I know. <laughs> he was very proud of that. But, yeah, I mean, they, yeah, I just always knew them with false teeth. And I remember my dad telling us a story that he was cycling back from um, the dance at Canusi and fell off the bike. I mean, it's a 12-mile cycle. Fell off the bike at King Craig, um, got back on the bike, uh, back home, got up the next morning, no false teeth borrowed his father's false teeth to do the milking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, they wouldn't have fitted him. I'll just send them in here to go and cycle back to King Craig and he found them lying oh, by the roadside. Oh, the teeth yes. and he gave wash his back. Well, at least they fitted him. Oh. I used to do our... Um... Uh, my sort of teenage boyfriend Paul, his mum had false teeth, and uh, and he had a beagle called Denver. There's a link to this one. And our greatest sort of joy was sneaking into her bedside cabinet and get a spare set of uh, false teeth, and then would put them in the dog. Oh no, it's right. the dog. Honestly, if you've ever seen a dog with human teeth, oh my god! It gets, oh my god! It I was amused. Oh god, I remember taking my with us. A very early boyfriend. Bring back false teeth. Oh, they were such fun. Oh, they were hellish, weren't they? They were all the same level. I mean, they're probably a lot better nowadays. But I do remember <laughs> coming in from the dance at night with the, um, dancing. the dancing with Willie Mingus. And, oh, my God, my mum or dad's false teeth in a glass at the kitchen thing. And you just think, how can you even pretend to be romantic I know. with a bloody glass of false teeth sitting there? Oh, God. Gross. It's funny, my mum, um, she she actually was a bit of ahead of her time. She spent quite a lot of money on cosmetic dentistry. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She was very proud of her teeth. Oh, but when she was very, like, you know, towards the end of her life, she did have to get um, the top ones. Yeah, it had to be false. And she, oh, my God, it, it broke your heart, actually. I mean, so she'd had a stroke. She was, you know, near the end of her life. But, my God, she did not want to be seen without her teeth in. No. And, you know, when she was in hospital and things, they weren't, mm. you know, I'm, I'm not slagging the hospital, but no, they weren't but as careful maybe as, yes. as they could have been. And sometimes she wouldn't oh. have her teeth in. And oh. and I didn't want to look at her. Oh, because you knew because what I she knew would be feeling. How much she would hate it yes. because she'd always been so proud of her teeth. I mean, it completely changes the shape of your face when you've not got she, your teeth She in. just, well, in Scotland, we would say it was clapped in. She, you, her face just kind of caved he in. Tits. And funny, I've still got a picture of her. Oh, my God, this has gone a bit dark, but I've got a picture of her. You know, she's sitting in the park in a wheelchair, you know, and they'd actually come out or whatever, I don't know, in a wee face. And I don't even like looking at that photograph because I just think, God, Mum, you would hate me that this photograph... In fact, I think I'll delete Ditch. it. 
Get rid of the leader. Absolutely. I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't want to, but... um. No, no, but I mean, that's like, yeah. I know, it's I funny, think, isn't it? Yeah, she wouldn't have wanted it, and you don't like looking at it, so who's so far? Yeah, no, I think I might. So yeah. anyway, now they say that my teeth, there you oh, go, I... as you get older, are moving, so I've got yeah. to get a retainer <gasps> to yeah. wear at night, so that's not exactly very oh, sort of alluring, is oh, it? God. Or they'll cross over, and I thought, oh, Jesus, can't be bothered with a retainer. I said, you know, can I be bothered with crooked teeth? I'll have to ask Karen what that's like. <laughs> my teeth. I'm just going to. Do you know what? I'm I'm very happy with my fucking teeth. Thanks very much. Although there is one at the bottom that's got a root missing, and I was thinking I might actually get that touched up. Would you ever but get them tightened? From, no, um, no. But you know what? I was. Oh God, I think my sister in America. She's got her teeth whitened. Oh, they've got good teeth, haven't they? Yeah, they have. And she, of course, to fit in America. Yeah, everybody's got their teeth done, mm. and she'd heard me slagging off these American. I think she was quite upset about it. So oh, sorry, sure. Kerry, if you listen to this one as well. But um, no, I, maybe we could get a two I, for one retainer. Fuck oh, off! <laughs> your saliva on my teeth. No, no, I'm not saying we share a bloody All retainer right. because your teeth are obviously a lot more crooked than mine. You'd have to get one specially made. I've got a more generous mouth, I would say. Oh. More generous mouth. What you do with that? <laughs> anyway, that's um, that, that's. Can you get your fist in it? It's always the test. Um, that shut you up, didn't it? I'm trying to think if I can. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, like, my lipstick would end up all over my hands. I'm not going to try just now. That, that's quite sexually provocative. I'm thinking. <laughs> Sorry. So that's the excitement of my life. What's happening in yours? Well, Kay, I've got the possibility of a new job coming up. I know, I can hardly believe I'm saying this. It's part-time. No, I'm not. It's very part-time, right? I know, I know. I never, honest to God, thought I would want to go back to work. But an imposter. Listen to me. It's voluntary as well. Oh, who wants to do that? It's childminding. Don't tell me you're going to be a girl. I am. Lisa's having a baby. Oh, okay. Congratulations. She's 16 weeks gone. Oh, you know, that is, I'm going to have to be nice to you. That I can't is so even believe lovely. I know. It's so lovely. It's so lovely. When she came up and, oh. and told me, she, I was asking her a week was, and she was saying, oh, well, we're doing these exams for sign language, and God, we're on the second one. It's really difficult. And somebody wanted to go to Kaupau, and I didn't really couldn't bother going out, but I went over there, and then... Um, oh god, work's kind of heavy at the moment. Then this morning I found out I was pregnant, and then I was like, No, Lisa. Anyway, that's it. Oh, how so that's wonderful. my part time job. Oh, how I'm wonderful. Hoping. I feel I'm so excited because to explain to anyone else, I had no, I'm absolutely accepted. I was never going to be a grandma, and, and I thought, Well. You know, that's fine. It's their decision. They've got a lovely life. And Alex certainly isn't going to have any kids. Oof, and Lisa, well. I had hoped. And then, and everyone had always said, oh, you know, they'll change your mind. And I was like, no, no, no. You don't know Lisa. She won't. And I've accepted it. it's not going to happen. And now, so she got a scan yesterday and oh, yeah, 16 weeks. That so, is just so excited. That is just lovely. I'm really a is. granny. Oh my God, Granny <laughs> Mackenzie! I've been knitting now for how long? I know. Oh, Christ, this poor child! You're not going to knit these terrible outfits for it, are you? These matinee jackets. Oh no, don't no, do no, that. no, 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 no! Please no, don't. I'm not, don't worry. I'm not. See if I see you with a ball of lemon wool. I'm going to take it off you. No, be white. Oh right, well, yeah, okay. be white. All right. Anyway, well, this is very good news. Very good news. Really We've exciting. got Susan Cookson with us today. I know. Yes, I know. Uh, been in lots and lots of popular dramas, lots and lots uh, of Casualty for a long time. Yes. With my pal yes, Sinetra. Yes. Yeah. Sarka from this woman. Right. Uh, now in Emmerdale playing nurse uh, Wendy Posner. There was a time, and I hope Susan doesn't mind me saying this, that she was going to give up acting and maybe become a nurse. Oh, no, I know. Yes. Yeah. Um, which I think was around the time that, that Susan's husband, uh, Malcolm, died. Um, and, you know, we can maybe talk a bit about that uh-huh. too. Um, but first of all, We've got email of the week, and I'm really delighted by this email of the week. Do you remember Maria that we heard from um, about a month ago? She was diagnosed with endometrial cancer. Yeah, yeah. Um, And she said 60 was no problem for her, but she hit 65 and she just had a feeling of dread. That's right. And she was diagnosed with endometrial cancer, and she was facing a full hysterectomy. Mm 
quite extensive treatment, um, and that was going to happen on the 4th of September. That's right. And we read that email. That's out. right. Um, well, she has been back in touch. Oh, she's a good correspondent. Uh, and she said, Dear Kay and Karen, I was so surprised to hear you read out my email in today's podcast, and I was so touched by your kind words. Uh, my operation went well on Monday. Oh, that's lovely. I'm now at home resting and recuperating. In fact, I was sitting in the garden listening to your podcast, enjoying the sunshine, eyes closed, and I suddenly realised it was my email that you Aww. were reading. And it brought tears to my eyes. Oh, Maria. She says, I was in a scared and sad place uh, when I sent it, but the operation is over and I feel so much stronger already. I'm so proud of how far I've come. God, I'm going to start. Uh, I know, I feel teary myself. I know. I still have to wait for my biopsy results to come, but hopefully, hopefully, Mm. it will be a good outcome. Sending you both love and best wishes, Maria. Well, right back to you, Maria. Touch, that's brilliant. Yeah, that really, really is. Again, thanks for taking the time to get in touch. And I'm so pleased you did. When you email, your initial email come through it, it struck us both didn't God, it? I know so listen definitely Thank you. you're going to have to make some tablet for Maria I, I, actually Maria you better let us know because right. not everyone likes tablet Maria we're going to be on to you to get your address we're sending you email we're starting we're sending you tablet for email of the week she might end up hasn't losing her teeth like you are your teeth are all crumbling oh, that's Christ, what used to tablet tablets. tablet was my downfall well, oh my there you god go. all, do you know what when I was five I had mm. to get taken to the dentist for five extractions. You're joking. Yeah, I know. I remember my dad really? took me. I remember it was a day that, you remember the black mask that they put over your face? No, that sounds horrific. You know how they, they no. knocked you out completely? The gas? No. Gas. Oh, I never did gas. No, absolutely not. Oh, my God. And I remember lying Jesus. there and the dentist had this big black gas mask. Like something so. from the warrant. <gasps> and it over your face. You're going to stop. <laughs> and he went out. And I had care and I had blood coming down my face, oh. the five teeth. And my dad took me to the sweetie shop to cheer me oh, up. no. <laughs> Oh my God! Give it five teeth. Remember the days. Anyway, we'll speak to Susan after this. I remember exactly the same. I went to the school clinic. The big black mask. I can remember this. I think it was oh, probably the smell. smell of the mask I could smell. That that rubber mask. Oh, um, and I and the same. I woke up and I. It was. They were like shredded wheat that shoved in my mouth. Oh. And I've got a gap there now because they took too many teeth out. So I've got a gap. Oh, God, it was right. terrifying. I can remember <laughs> saying to the dentist, you know, he's coming with the mask, you know he's yeah, coming, yeah. going, stop, stop, I've got something to tell you, I've got something to tell you. I can remember saying that to him, like, boom, off you yeah, go. That's horrible. Oh, my God. Awful. Anyway, hello, Susan. Hello. <laughs> now, I have to send best wishes from our mutual friend, Sinetra Sarkar. Oh, God, you Sinetra. Because you worked together in Casualty, and I said to her, I was speaking to her on the phone the other day, and I said, oh, I'm going to be speaking to, to Susan Cookson, and she said, oh, cookie. <laughs> um, and she said, make sure that you send her my love. Oh, well, right. And she also up. said, mention Denise Robertson. Oh, lovely Denise Robertson, that's right. Oh, my God. She just did the best that when I left, she got yeah. this recorded from Denise Robertson because I love Denise Robertson and I remember telling um, her and Matt a funny story about a phone in when she used to be the agony on, on um, Richard and Judy and we were actually filming but we were sort of back and shot in resource and it was literally for a gurney coming in and doing this big 360 turn and we just happened to be in the back and shot from a previous scene um, and at one point it would <laughs> This girl was coming in with all the film crew and sound, and we were doubled up laughing from this story. And Sinatra just kept saying, Please, Cookie, stop, stop saying it, stop saying it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and doing my impression. She tried to get her in my last episode, but they, it, they wouldn't have it. But she, she got this message recorded on the set of um, This Morning from Denise Robertson, and they played it to me at my leaving do. And I was, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. Susan Cookson's leaving casualty. That'll be a devastation for the nation at her evacuation. <laughs> it was hilarious. <laughs> well, she did say you were a very good mimic, and you clearly <laughs> are. You slid into both Scouser and Denise Robertson there very easily. I tell you what, the, that was the first real regular job I had where I had to learn to use my short-term memory because the script's coming thick and fast. And I'm like, I don't know what I've, what have I done. I don't, I don't know what I've done. And then and then there's another knock on the door, and I open the door, and Simon McCorkindale was standing there. 
hello, welcome to Casualty. Lovely to meet you, Corky. And, and, <laughs> and he, got, he always said to me, just remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's something I'm cooking. Oh, my God. And then when I went down onto the floor and, of course, I had, I, I don't know, I was almost like attacking somebody, this big scene, and I just didn't have a clue what I was doing. Because it's because really for continuing drama, you need to use you need to exercise your short term memory, and eventually I got very good at it. And then there's been this gap. There's been a kind of gap for um, continuing drama until I joined Emmerdale, and I had to kind of go back to that place again. And it was especially having gone through the menopause. I can't tell you how frightening it was. God, when I think about that first year, I most of the time I was just terrified. And that awful imposter syndrome of I'm going to get, I really, I mean, I've spent my entire career thinking I'm going to get found out. Mm-hmm. How am I winging this? So was that getting back into sort of full-time work after caring for Malcolm? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it had been, I'd done some theatre work. I think I'd do, I think there'd been a little bit of telly, but there'd been two really good theatre jobs that I did that that was a real kind of, at the time, was a boost to my confidence. Um, but then, you know, it was bits and pieces, few and far between. And again, as the clock's ticking, and from a financial point of view, that that kind of sense of security as you're getting older, and in this kind of profession. There was just this little voice in my head thinking, I don't know how much longer I can wait for the phone to ring. I just, I mean, for a long time, I felt like I was going mad. I I mean, I obviously had some level of depression once he died. And just that taking stock of, you know, his diagnosis and getting through that five and a half years. And then after he died, I dealing with my sons and just trying to keep it all together and, and doing that. I've just got to get on with it. I've just got to get on with it. But over time, you do start to sort of decipher little bits. It was, I think the main thing for me was I really, truly lost a sense of who I, who I was because so much of that was with him, was with Malk. When Emmerdale came along, it, it, couldn't, it couldn't have come at a better time because I was literally on the verge of changing career. I, I mean, I was, I was going to see somebody to talk about getting into nursing. I was 10 minutes from visiting um, this friend who who was nursing management in Wakefield, and I was we chatted about it before, and she said, you know, you could you could get into a basic level of nursing. You know, you'll have to sit a test. Da 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 da. So I was going over to spend some time with her to go through this, and then this message pops up. Hey, Cookie, it's Jane Hudson here. Is it all right if I give you a call in five minutes? And I'm like, oh my god. Um, my sister was passing through the front. And I said, oh, Jane Hudson's just sent me a message. She wants to speak to me. And all around was like, oh, my God, this is it. This is it. And I went, hang on a minute. I said, it could be like six nice episodes of. Anyway, I, I spoke to Jane and, and she she was asking, are you still in Sheffield? I said, yeah. She said, look, we've got a breakdown for this new character that's coming in. And as soon as I read it, it's you. She said, there's nobody else I want to play it. And I know <clears throat> you will play it brilliantly. Um, how do you feel about it? How do you want to come and live in the village with us? Do you want to think about it? And I said, uh, no, I don't need to think about it. I just said yes. No, I was just gonna ask how long Malcolm was ill for. He um from diagnosis, it was about five and a half years, and it was the biggest shock. It was literally Sunday morning, waking up. And I'd sat up on the side of bed, uh, the side of the bed. So I had my back to him, and I thought, oh, "I'll go make us a cup of tea." About half past eight, nine o'clock, Sunday morning. <clears throat> I'll go make us a cup of tea. Boys were still asleep, and the next thing, he's like pushing me in the small of my back. I thought, "All right." So he was just about to turn around to say, "I'm gonna get the tea," and he was having a full blown seizure. And he was just, his arms were outstretched. That's why they were in the small of my back. I thought, as I looked at him, I thought he's having a heart attack. I thought, I mean, I can feel it now, the panic of turning and looking at him. And I'm trying to, I was, I would pick the phone up and I was trying to ring 999 and I don't know what, I, I was ringing anything but 999. 
And then, the, so this must have been 60 seconds, 70 seconds, something like that. And then the next thing, he just kind of fully relaxed and almost kind of collapsed. And he couldn't, he couldn't really speak. So then I'm thinking he's had a stroke. He said he's had a stroke and I'm trying to talk to him. And anyway, eventually I rang an ambulance and ambulance came and we went to the hospital. And the, I mean, the, the ambulance were brilliant. They said, we don't, we don't think he's, he's not had a heart attack. He's not had a heart attack. He might have had a stroke. So we got to the hospital and as the time went on waiting for somebody to come and see to him, he kind of, you know, he was recovering more and he was able to speak. He was a bit slurred and he was just really sort of drowsy. And then as the time went on, everything cognitively started to come back. He was completely aware of what had happened. He'd not lost consciousness at any point. Um, so they came and they they did some tests. They did some testing his reflexes. They thought they said we don't. You've not had a stroke. You've not no, had no. a heart attack. We think you might have had a seizure of some kind, but that can happen to anybody at any point. They did some bloods to see if he had some infection that you know his temperature could have spiked. Wasn't that? They said we're going to refer you to um, a neurologist <clears throat> just to get you checked out. So. We saw this neurologist about, well, he, oh, no, that was it. He, he had another seizure. It, um, it was a couple of days later, and he was really taking it easy. And I took, they, they said to him straight away, you can't drive now. You have to be free of this for 12 months. And he was devastated at that. So this particular morning, I'd taken the boys to school, and I came back, and he, I checked on him, and he was asleep. And then I'd gone to make a cup of tea, and then I just heard him shout. And I, I ran upstairs and it had happened again and he, he'd almost fallen out of bed. It, it had happened again. So I managed, we managed to get a cancellation with this neurologist and we went and he went through everything. And he, again, he, he's, he's, like, he's like looking on the internet. And I thought, well, I could have done that. Uh, and he said, the fact that you, you remain conscious the whole time and you were aware of everything, you know, the way you've described it, he knew every aspect of it. He said, I do think it's sleep apnea. And he said it could be, it could happen several more times. It may never happen again. It's terrifying when it happens, but it's completely harmless. You're not going to suffer any long-term effects. But he said to be on the safe side, I think what we'll do is we'll we'll do um, a scan on the carotid artery to make sure there's nothing narrowing to the brain. And we'll get a scan. Just to, he said, but I'm not expecting anything back from that at all. So that was it. So we left, um, and he was fine for a few days. And then um, I was coming back from school one day. I, took, I was picked the boys up, and he was just stood at the front door, and the door was open as I pulled up, and he just had the phone in his hand, and I'm looking at him, and the boys are like, "What's the matter, Dad? What's the matter?" And I got to the door and he, he said, I've, I've got a brain tumour. And they, they just that they just phoned him up and told him while he was at home, this this neurologist that he spoke to, and he was on his own. Um, and then I took the phone and he, you know, he said, I'm I'm really sorry, I'm I'm so shocked at, at the results, but there is quite a significant brain tumor. So then it's like, and Matt, the worst thing was Malk had said to him. <clears throat> so what what does that what does that mean now? Meaning, what's the next course of treatment? What's going to be the plan? And apparently, this this guy said to him, "Well, you you're looking at maybe five to ten years." And Malk said to him, "That that's not what I was asking you. I was asking what's the next course of what's the treatment." So that yeah, then you just um, then we had to go and see a specialist, and then. You'd, I've been thinking about it these last couple of days, you knowing I was going to be chatting to you. And I remember those early days of going into Western Park Hospital in Sheffield, which is just the most amazing hospital. But you and you walk in, and I guess it was a bit like me on day one of casualty, where you're like, I don't understand any of this. I don't, but I feel like I'm part of this machine. It was, it's like you're embarking on this huge machine that you're seeing all these patients in and out in various stages of their treatment and you're like how did this happen how are we here how's from a couple of weeks ago when we're now here um 
And it is, it's like you get on this conveyor belt uh, and you become a part of this, this machine that's, you know, trying to save your life. And it, and it was really tough going. It was tough, really tough going for the boys, but the, you know, we just, Malk always just wanted to try and keep it as normal as possible. He's like, well, this is how it is. This is what we're going to do. This is what I'm doing so I can be here with you and we'll get through it. We'll get through it. Uh, and he went through very, I mean, he had, he had surgery. That was unbelievable. I was, I was doing a play when he actually went to have the operation. My brother stayed with him. Um, and I rang my brother in the interval of, of this play I was doing in Manchester, which was about a family in Manchester and the brother was dying of cancer. It was just the weirdest thing. Uh, and my brother said he's he's come through the operation and they can't believe how well he, he was chatting to the nurses when they were bringing him out. And they'd removed most of the tumour, but the tiny little bit they couldn't get was so deep in his brain that if they tried to get that, you know, it could have been fatal. So then it was radiotherapy and chemotherapy. The radiotherapy was about a month's worth every day for a month. And they had talked about uh, it can, we, we call our um, radiotherapy patients to, you know, to deal with the uh, brain tumors, our post it patients, because it can cause short term memory loss. And they did, it had, He'd had the operation and he'd had the radiotherapy and then they decided to do a memory test, which he was just passed with flying colours. They were like, even after what you've had, we can't believe how high you've scored. It was in the 90s. So that was all good. That was a good marker. And then he'd had a round of chemo and then they monitored things and they said, no, it's the little bit that was left. It's, it's growing. So then they tried a different chemo and that that was holding it back. And then, so this all went on over a period of about th three years. I mean, his health at times wasn't great and he would be incredibly tired. He carried on working for, for a little while. He had various jobs and he carried on working. But then it really started to take its toll on him. And then the memory loss kicked in and it was almost... It was like overnight almost. I was in Edinburgh. I was doing a play in Edinburgh, and he was here with the boys. My sister lives around the corner, so everyone was helping to keep an eye on things. Um, and he'd got train tickets because they were going to come and stay at the flat in Edinburgh, uh, Malk and the boys. And my sister was coming back, uh, and she saw Malk sat at the window. And she, I, I thought, I'll just go and check on him. So she, she came in, and she said, are you all right? And he said, I've got the, and this is a man who's traveled the world. I mean, literally traveled the world because he was an actor. Um, and he said, I'm, I'm looking at these tickets and I, I just, I can't, I can't figure them out. And she's, she said, well, that they're yours. That's your outward and return. And that one's for Rory and that one's for Dan. Yeah. Um, anyway, it, it was starting to kick in and, They'd got the train to Edinburgh and he missed the stop and Dan was having to help, you know, and he was, Dan was really quite young at that point. Um, anyway, the, the memory loss just seemed to go really quickly. I mean, he knew who everybody was, but the, the short term memory was bad. And if sometimes I wasn't aware of it, you know, Rory would be sitting in the living room with him and I'd go into the kitchen to make a cup of tea. And Rory's only told me this recently. And he's, you know, he said, I'd look at dad. He said, and he'd be crying. And, I, you know, he'd be like, dad, what, what's the matter? And he'd say, your mum's left me, aren't she? She's left me. And he said, she's in the, what are you talking about? She's in the kitchen, she's making you a cup of tea. And it was, it was that, you know, it really started to play mind games with him. It was, uh, and you know, towards the, I mean, he always kept his humour. Um, he always kept his sense of humour. And quite, <laughs> quite near to the end. Uh, and I had carers coming in to help, um, you know, move him from the sitting room. To, we made the back, the front sitting room into our bedroom. Um, so I had carers coming in. There was this one day we were getting him ready to move him through into the bedroom. And I was, I decided to sing to him. Um, I can't remember it was I was singing to him. Anyway, I started singing to him. <laughs> he leant forward in his chair and, and, I, and he looked quite distressed. And I said, what, what, what's the matter? What's the matter? He goes like this. And I said, what was the matter? And he went, it doesn't sound as good as you think it does. 
<laughs> I said, you cheeky bastard for that. I said, right, get yourself to bed. You think you think so funny. So he never lost his sense of humor and he never really lost the fight. He was determined he w- he was gonna he was gonna get through it. Um and I still we had such a good marriage and we were such good friends. I still there's I guess. I guess what I've done in the last couple of years is subconsciously I've kind of, you have to put a block to it because I, I really have suffered with grief. Um, but there are times when I, when I think of certain instances and it's like, I can't believe it's not here. I just, how did we end up like this? I, I you know, because I really thought we were going to grow old and gray together. And I, I, at 50, I can't believe that at 58 he was gone. And I've surpassed that. That's the other. That's been the other weird thing the last couple of years is I've now surpassed that. I've gone past when he passed. It's it's weird. Mm. I mean, I, I I'm not I'm not saying this to pile it on, but I mean, when I said I was speaking to Sinetra, that I was speaking to you, and she said you and Malcolm that she had a conversation with you at one point when her relationships weren't going so well, and it was if I can ever have a relationship with like you and Malcolm, that's the one mm. that I want. Um, you know. You know, you you were together. What 1993? You got together. Yes. Well, we got married in '93, uh, but we'd been together five years before then. Yeah, five, five, five and a half years, something like that. Before we got married, we bought a nice little house together in Todmorden, and we got married there. And then I was expecting Rory, and then that was when we moved to Sheffield. I remember when he was diagnosed. You know, we hung the phone up, and it, it was just—it's like you're in this weird dream, and. The, and I said to him, I wish it had been me. I wish it had been me because I always I always felt he was the better parent. He was and just the most amazing person. There's no that I mean, the messages when, when he passed, there was nobody he met that that didn't just fall in love with him or just, you know, he was just like he was just wonderful. Um, and he really was. I, I and I'll say it till my dying breath. He was the better part of me. He he was that, I th- and I know now. I know why I struggled so much over this last seven years since um, since he passed, because he he really did complete me. He was so strong, and and I've always doubted myself. And he, you know, he'd either laugh it off or he, you know he would always talk me through it. The worst you know, when, when I was anxious about a job or going for a job and, um, yeah, he was just, he absolutely completed me. Uh, and so it, so when he went this, and it, it was, I think it must've been about at least a year, I think, into losing him. And I was in a bad way and I, and I thought I'm going to have to do something. I started looking on the internet at dealing with grief and I remember just reading this thing. It made so much sense because, you know, friends would ring me up and say, how, how are you doing? And I was always grateful for it. But, I'd, you know, and you'd start by going, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I'm 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 OK. Yeah, but how are you? And a lot of the time I would say, I, I don't know. And I don't know who I am anymore. And it must have sounded like a broken record, but I just didn't. And then I remember reading this thing that said, you know, as well as grieving for the person you've lost, you're grieving for yourself because the chances are the person you've lost is so a part of you that that part of you has, has now gone. And it ju- it was like, oh, my, yeah, of course. Of course I have this sense of I don't know who I am anymore because who I am was with him and he's not here anymore. It, it was just It was just mad crazy. It, it really was. And I suppose a bit of you is grieving for the future that you thought you would have, but, mm-hmm. you know, you're not going to have, and, you know, with your boys, mm-hmm. et cetera. And for my boys, you know, the, to have two sons that could have ha- could have been having the best time with their dad. I mean, they would have been like three mates. They would have been like three, you know, three brothers. And, you know, Mel was so into sport and rubbish with sport. Um, Gaming, you know, computer games, all these really intricate computer games. He was into all of that. They love that. I mean, they would have, he would have just been such an amazing influence on their life. And it's been very hard for them. It's been, you know, we don't 
talk about it very much because it is it's still really hard for them. I've underestimated what they did see and what they went through on watching this the demise of this man over this five and a half year period that just kind of became the normality in the home. You know, and they were they were very young. Dan was fourteen when he when he died. Rory was Rory was twenty twenty one, and he adored them. And the the one thing that that kind of I think it will always stop me from moving on in some ways. I don't I don't ever believe I'll ever have a relationship again. I think that that's it, and I'm kind of okay with it. Um, was that he the only t- he would get upset occasionally. Only occasionally, and I'd say to him, you know, what is it? What can I help? What what is it? And he 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 would get upset, and he'd just say, "I just want more time with you and the boys. I just want a bit more time." And that's what that's the thing that I can't, I just can't get past is that I know how much he wanted to be here. He, he didn't get to that point where it's like, okay, this is my lot. I've had a great innings. I've got two great sons. I've had a great marriage. I've had a fabulous career. He never said, why me? Poor me. But I just, he fought so hard. He wanted to stay here longer. He wanted, you know, just be, really be around for, for the boys. Yeah. Do you think the boys talk to each other? I mean, you're saying that it's too difficult at the moment to talk to the boys. Um, no, I, I, I don't think they do. Because, I mean, I know when, you know, when, when my mum died at 58, died very suddenly from an asthma attack. Uh, and you go through that initially as a family, you all come together and you're all helping each other. Um, and then several months go on and then you're still feeling a particular way. But, you know, that sister looks like she's getting on with it or your brother. Looks. So then you go, well, I won't say it because I don't want to rock their boat. And that's your that I think that's kind of your subconscious way of protecting the rest of the family. It's like, well, I'll I'll just try and deal with it myself. And I think they're a little bit like that. Um, you know, Rory struggles to look at pictures um, because, you know, he can't, he can remember, he's not like they were really little and they can't remember him. They can remember him very well. Um, and he was just great. He, he just was. I can, I'll never be able to sing his praises enough. He was just the most lovely man. But I do feel because of this job, I have gone through a real transition now and I do feel like I've, I've got a sense of me back again. I was thinking so much about this yesterday when I was doing the garden and I was listening to you. Hmm. Um, the one thing that I wish I could be a little bit more is a bit more brave. I'm trying to figure out why that is because there's times when I go, no, I am going to do more traveling. But then, you know, you turn the news on and it's like, oh, you know, there's all these delays at the airport or there's this problem or this problem. And it's like, oh, I couldn't cope with that. I just could not cope with being sat at an airport for six hours. So forget that, forget those. But I do, I just want to be a bit braver and I, and I, I want to try a few new things and just, yeah, feel like I am living a bit. I mean, like I say, the, the job has been such saving grace and it's like I've, I've, I'm now part of another family and, and just getting back into that routine of being in the workplace. And I love it. I absolutely love my job. But there's got I know there's got to be a little bit more. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of ready for it. But the relationship is something that you just at this stage you couldn't No, it's funny really. Me and um me and Sam Giles and Tony Audenshaw, to- Tony who plays Bob, uh, and Sam plays Bernice. It was a few weeks ago and we I don't know, we just we kind of got chatting about this, that and the other. And um Tony lost his wife, I think about six months after I lost Malk. Um you know, similar sort of, t- well, I think it was a bit quicker with Ruth. But anyway, we had similar stories. That's been a real comfort, being able, somebody I'm working so closely with, we, we it's not like we talk about it very much, but there's just that understanding. And they were talking to me about, you know, do you think you'll meet somebody else? And I, I said, I just, I can't explain it. It's There is a sense of guilt if I think about, would I want, would I even want to try a relationship? There is a sense of guilt that, I just still feel so a part of my relationship with Mal that I can't, I just can't move on in that way. Do you not think that's something to do with the boys though as well in terms Mm. of not being able to maybe have that 
conversation with them about how you're all suffering in different ways and I'm almost like reaching some sort of not closure but it sounds such a discussion to be had there I think it is but um I don't know whether it's because of our occupation so that you know there would be times even before we had the kids Mark would be away for like I remember we'd not long since got together and he went on this tour of South America we'd been together for about six months and he got this tour of South America and he was going to be away for three months and I'm like oh my god we had the, we had ended up with the biggest phone bill I can't tell you I mean, thousands of pounds on the phone bill. It was just ridiculous. But there's always been that sense of sometimes one of us has to go away and work. And they can be away, you know, you could be on a drama over a two-month period and you're spending four days a week away and then you come back for a long weekend or whatever it is. So I, I, I don't know whether there's, there, again, subconsciously, there's this like, well, he's just, He's just off doing a job. It's like it, it, it doesn't feel like that's the end of that relationship. And I I don't, I mean, whether I need to speak to somebody about it, I don't know. But I guess it doesn't bother me. Mm. I'm not like but I'm desperate to move on and I can't. This is how you feel today. And you are good with that. You might feel the same in a month and six months or a year, or you might not. But all you can deal with is how you feel today. Mm. And if that is the way that you feel today, that's mm -hmm. it. Who knows what the future, well, God, you of everyone will know. Who knows what the future holds, you know? No, no, but, but I do agree. I think at this stage now, I'm turning 60 next year, um, and there is that, there is that like, really? Because in my head, I'm still 28. Um, where did that go? Where did that life go? I remember sitting in the classroom with my friends at secondary school going, oh, my God, can you imagine when you're 40? Oh, my God. It, I mean, yeah. I remember that conversation vividly. I do. I remember telling my friends, I'm going to shoot myself when I'm 50. I know that's very non pc but I said that. I'm going to shoot myself when I'm 50. I could not even think of it. But yeah, the, you know, I've got really good family around me. You know, my sisters, my brother, his family, uh, and we do go on holidays together. We visit each other all the time. My um, oldest sister literally lives three doors away. We, we've just been in Norfolk together. I've got I've got great friends. So my friend Sue's Packer from um, Casualty, we're planning on meeting up um, sort of over Manchester way because she's been working. And we don't see each other as often as, as we should be doing. And that's one of the things I definitely want to correct because we just, we just get on so well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's something that I know I need to address is even just making short visits or going to stay with a girlfriend or whatever it is. I need, I need to start making more time for that. But there is still the mum in my head going, I know, but I need to be here for the boys. I need to. But they're young men now. They, they can look after themselves. I know. Tell them to do it themselves like I do with mine. <laughs> Listen, did. do you want a quick game of Big Six or Bingo to... I do. I'm not missing out on that. <laughs> right, go on. Right. So, uh, two numbers between one and 60. Give me the first one. Eight. Oh, She's so bloody controlling. She's always trying to guess what the... See what the question is. Heart and God, we probably know this. Hardest year of your life. Hmm. Yeah, it's got to have been... Um, seven years ago yeah that'll have been the hardest year I don't think any I mean it was bad when my mum died but yeah I don't think anything's going to be as bad as that okay so Susan another number uh 20 20 when if ever do you feel old Chris <laughs> <laughs> I'd finished that gardening yesterday and tried to get up the stairs Jesus. <laughs> and I'd be with my in-laws today and I, I'm saying to them, we're all getting old. I said, uh, and I, I actually quoted that. I said, trying to get up the stairs last night. I said, my knees, I thought they were going to explode, but I've discovered castor oil. Oh, my does that work? God. Can I just say, ladies, listeners, look up the health benefits of castor oil. Do you rub it on or drink it? I don't, I don't know if there's forms that you can take it. The the sort of experts I've listened to, it's not about taking it. It is about applying it in right. compasses and on the face, on the joint. I put it on my bunions last night. I've got the most, my bunions. Jesus, my feet were killing me last night. 
And I'd got into bed and I thought, just get out of bed and put the castor oil on your bunions and just see. This morning, I'm like, <laughs> seriously. That's the, cool all the that. pain had gone in my feet. So, that, so before I went out today, earlier on, I was about to go down the stairs. I thought, Jesus, my knees. Um, and I, I rubbed a load of castor oil in them. And it felt warm. It actually felt warm. Castor oil. Look it up. You won't she regret it. Eggs, castor oil. Susan, I bought her vulva oil and she <laughs> hasn't even tried it. I don't need it. But the castor oil can go there too. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, I'll get you some castor oil. Can you choose to use it whenever? Like, one of our, our local shops. And they've just got some more in. And I'm go- after I've after I've finished speaking to you, I'm going down to pick up two more bottles of it. Well, I'll try it. <laughs> I'll try it. Are we going to finish on that castor oil? We're, we're going to finish on castor oil. Big up castor oil. <laughs> this program is sponsored by castor, castor oil. <laughs> oh, Susan, thank you so much. It's been so lovely to speak yeah, to you. Absolute lovely. pleasure. Absolute yeah. pleasure. And just keep up this amazing work. I love it. This is. Oh, yeah! I love your podcast. It's wow. revolutionised my life. When I had my earbuds on listening to you, it's like I've got two pals with me walking around the house. It's great. Oh, that's oh nice. thank you, thank you. Oh, so Keep on keeping on. Well, we'd be Susan's friend any day of the week, and we are now ditching the vulva oil for the castor oil without delay. Next week, my fellow loose woman Ruth Langsford joins us. Not that Karen's going to know who she is. Keep those emails coming. Podcast at htb60.com. How is the big six O working out for you? No time to relax. Subscribe to the Hypno SOS podcast. It's calming, effective, and best of all, it's short around 10 minutes so you can always find time to listen. So, if you need help with sleep, reducing anxiety, or letting go of stress, or you just need a boost, Hypno SOS is for you. Written and presented by a therapist with over 30 years experience, Ursula James, that's me, by the way. Its weekly episodes contain deep relaxation and powerful and highly effective suggestions to help you get control in your life. With around 200 episodes to choose from and new ones each week, you'll definitely find something that will appeal to you. It's not hypnosis. It's Hypno SOS. And in case you just zoned out there, I'll spell it for you. H-Y-P-N-O-S-O-S. Available on all the usual platforms. Go on, give it a try. (laughs) 